Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This is the podcast for the fourth Sunday of Advent, which falls on December 18th, 2022. Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. The psalm is Psalm 80, 1 through 7, and verses 17 through 19. The second reading is Romans chapter 1, 1 through 7. And our gospel from Matthew is the first chapter, verses 18 through 25. And now we feel like we are truly in the Christmas season as we recognize this uh, um, fourth Sunday in our season of Advent. Yeah, I can't believe we're here already. Uh, and and yeah, it just went went by fast. So. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. I've I've uh, I've never been a huge fan of Matthew's birth narrative, probably because Luke's is so much better. <laughs> you know, um, it, and I always thought, well, at least Matthew tried. You know, Mark couldn't be bothered, but at least Matthew gave it a shot. But it's not nearly as poetic or as beautiful as the Lucan one. But I'm I'm thinking about it a little bit differently this year. Hmm. Uh, I'm still a little bit skeptical. I don't think Joseph has really thought through anything in this. But it, you know that's that's part of it. But you know this is again this is a gospel that I think is going to take us into among other things the notion of how difficult faith is and the dangers of bad religious leadership because of the suffering it inflicts upon people of little faith or people who already are dealt a bad hand in life. And so Matthew's going to talk about faith being fragile. Matthew's going to talk about the importance of our responsiveness to God and to God's calling that we experience in Jesus. And, and Joseph, I think, is showing some of those things here early on in a flawed way, in a way that lacks complete understanding, of course, but who has that? So I want to be more generous to Joseph this year and say, at least the guy's trying <laughs> and, and he needs a dream, you know, a rather heavy handed way of, of correction. But then he's responsive to the dream. He's responsive to the command. You know, he, he does what he's supposed to do, but it takes him a while to figure it out and it doesn't come naturally to him, which in some ways is not a horrible analogy for what the life of faith looks like. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Like, I, there's a lot I think we could criticize here, but here's a guy who's caught up in something way bigger than he is, and he's doing the best he can. <laughs> and, and fortunately, God isn't going to let him mess it up. Well, there's in some ways that's what the story does. I wish there was more about Mary. I wish there was more about the emotions of this, but we're not going to squeeze it out of Matthew. No, but there's something in that, right? In that, uh, as you said, God's not going to let Joseph mess it up. Um, but I think one thing, one aspect of this is this, this you know, intervention <laughs> uh, that, uh, or that the promise of God's intervention, the left of our own devices that we would easily, uh, easily stay in the corner or, or follow, uh, you know, follow the societal expectations or, uh, which is, you know, and Joseph is a righteous man. And so he's being righteous and, and he's doing what he's supposed to do. And, and we do what we are supposed to do. Uh, but then you have, you have this angel appears to him in a dream. And, and so there is something about that theological promise of God's, God's intervening, uh, God's intervening into, corruption into injustice into the spaces and places where uh where we maybe don't have hope or we don't know how what direction to go or we find ourselves just kind of following you know the status quo and so there's and but of course it's not just an interruption it's a, it, a intervention it's a total disruption of the world as we know it uh so there's that as well but there is something in that uh, kind of the kind of the regularity of Joseph and uh, to a certain extent he doesn't speak at all uh, and just and kind of as you said caught up in his you know caught up in this 
an incredible reality. Uh, but then the promise of, yeah, the promise of God showing up. I, um, a lot of times I get frustrated with, um, the numbering that we have for, um, you know, the way that we read uh, the Bible and it's, you know, all of these verses um, and we lose the narrative flow because uh, not just the way the lectionary breaks it up, but simply the way the the text has been broken up. And uh, so um, I'm going to do something strange to get to something. And that is um, to break up verse 18 uh, into verse 18a going with the first the previous 17 verses. Um, so um, Matthew opens up with this, you know, Ancestry.com preview, you know, this um, beta version of uh, our uh, uh, DNA testing to find out what is our lineage. And that seems so boring for us. Um, and one of my students did a wonderful job of, of preaching uh, you think your family's messed up? Let's pay attention to Jesus. And um, what stands out in in that those first seventeen verses, as we're getting this heritage of Jesus, is the intrusion of not just women, but the wrong kind of women, um, into the lineage of Jesus, which is this. This is going to be an unfolding reality of of God's uh, salvation is for all the world, regardless of the caste and class systems that our society would name for them. And if you take that lead, if if you follow me with that lead, then maybe you'll you'll see where I'm going here. In a culture where women have no privilege and no power. And men have all of the privilege and all of the power. Naming Joseph as righteous and then describing that being thrust into this crazy situation where the cultural law says he could step away immediately. He does not disgrace this woman. And, and he, he could have done that. He could have publicly dismissed her, but hearing the call of God to do something different, he yields to that as opposed to the culture. And uh, I think that's pretty powerful as an intrusion that is consistent with Matthew saying, um, we're used to the men uh, in Jesus' lineage. The reason that these women are in trouble is because the men messed up. I mean, Bathsheba is because of David's uh, inappropriateness. Tamar is because of Judah's inappropriateness. I mean, it's not their fault that they're in the situations that they're in. And yet here we have already a turn because David, uh, David, um, because Joseph is going to do the right thing in response to God's, God's call, even though the culture would enable him to do something different. And that's a different read that I think might be consistent with what Matthew is lining up. I just throw that out there. I just worry that even dismissing Mary quietly, it doesn't do her a whole lot of favors, but it's uh But he doesn't do it. Nobody tries to. Exactly. But he, but God <laughs> intrudes, which yeah. you said, God's not going to let Joseph, <laughs> even Joseph mess yeah. this up. Yeah. And, but but Joseph, he has to comply. Remember, mm -hmm. remember I'm, the, I'm the Wesleyan here. So, you know, we have to respond to God's <laughs> convenient grace. <laughs> yep. Yep. <clears throat> excuse me. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I, um, I, I, one of the reasons I love podcasting, doing this is the, are the things that I learn. And I had never thought of this before. Um, but in Stan Saunders' this commentary at the very end, he draws this comparison to uh, you will name him Emmanuel, which means God with us, with the uh, the very end of Matthew's gospel, though I'm with you always to the end of the age, which mm -hmm. you, you're both nodding as if you see that all the time. But mm -hmm. uh, I never thought of that. And this is a, a gospel in a sense that tries to illustrate just how confusing and how wonderful and how liberating and how 
disruptive it is when God indeed is, is, is with us yeah. and how that then carries over into the church's mission, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, another, in another direction for this text, uh, is, is verse 21, she will bear a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins kind of ends up being, you know, Jesus job description, if you will, uh, that that's, and so to, to put the entirety of Jesus ministry in this framework, that, uh, that Jesus will save people from their sins. Uh, and then you, and then you, uh, they shall name him Emmanuel. I think you want to hold both of those together. And to say, to what extent salvation from sins, the answer to that is God with us, so that it really casts a different kind of framework on salvation, uh, that, that, that salvation is, is this God's presence uh, uh, to take away sin, to take away God's separation uh, to, to, to re-enter into our lives to, and so it kind of, it, I hope that this is making sense that it kind of blows apart how our kind of boxes of what salvation is. And I think it also kind of, uh, exposes and blows apart what our expectation of how to define sin. And so I think that could be, uh, a, also a homiletical direction is to hold, to hold a Jesus job description and an Emmanuel together and say, what, what, what does that look like? And what does that mean? Sure. It sounds like a Johannine reading of Matthew. <laughs> no, I know. I kind of thought that I'm like, Whoa, what's going on? I'm, I'm trying not to do that. <laughs> well, you know, if, if you think though, what, as you were saying that Caroline, I was thinking that if sin is separation from God and God with us, is what we will hear in the Beatitudes. Uh, if God with us is this abundance of, of healing and um, the meek raised up and the hunger, hungry and thirsty um, fed and, 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 and filled, that is what one would expect if God is with us, you know, it, when God was with the Israelites as they wandered through the wilderness, it was a very present help, as the song would say. Um, and, and so I, I think there's a way in which, yeah, it would sound Johan, and especially when it's Caroline's voice, um, but maybe it's just so consistently what the presence of Jesus does for us that even if it's in different words and different highlights in Matthew, it's the same character of God. And we miss it when we think it's just heaven when we die and to be able to say, my sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. It's real in, in Matthew, it's, it's, it, it makes a difference here and now. Mm -hmm. Should we go to Isaiah, speaking of God with us? Hmm. So the context behind this is, um, is, is interesting because Ahaz isn't, you know, like the perfect king of Israel. And, um, and so he gets to ask, um, well, I, I, I want a sign. And, um, and uh, um, I don't want to put the Lord to the test. And the prophet says, you're going to get one. Um, and, and this is going to be the sign, uh, a young woman is with child. She'll bear a son and his name, God with us. Wow. If, if we want to talk about this whole idea of God in the midst of our struggles, recognizing this moment in ancient Israel's reality, and that the prophet is speaking to a king that Israel might not want to be so proud of, but to give the promise that is the hope for ancient Israel and remains the hope for the world today. Um, 
it, it's kind of a, if we think about last week's, um, it's kind of a look and see um, God with us. And this is good news. And God's eager to give the sign. I, I love this where God's like, go ahead, ask me anything, ask for anything, anything you want. And he has this like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to ask anything of God. And God's like, I'll, I'll give you a sign anyway. <laughs> you know, just, you know. <laughs> uh, and here's the sign. And it's going to look really ordinary. Mm-hmm. You know, that people are still having children mm-hmm. here uh, when, when <laughs> as, the, as the armies are marching toward us, that there still is this hope for the future of, of, of people not of the of the community not becoming wiped out and that god is eager to call attention to that mm-hmm. as opposed to god being more cagey and you know mm-hmm. inapproachable mm-hmm. there's some there's something joyful i have to imagine in terms of how that oracle gets delivered yeah. as opposed to an in-your-face kind of an oracle you know oh, I, I agree yeah mm-hmm we're about to be wiped out. I'm not exactly being faithful. And God says, no, nah, business as usual. Yeah, I got and, a sign for you. And, and that's the sign that I'm still God. Mm-hmm. I'm still with you. And mm-hmm. you're still going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you want to move <laughs> to the psalm? <laughs> sure. Well, I, know, sure. I know what someone's going to say about the psalm, but go ahead, Caroline. What could it be? What? I wasn't going to say use it liturgically. There's a refrain. <laughs> Restore yeah. us, O oh God. Yeah. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Yes, mm-hmm. I think that would be a, a, a very lovely uh, refrain for mm-hmm. some of the homiletical directions that we are taking. It also is, I mean, you get, yeah, I, again, you get this sense of, I think, I was hearing it in what you were saying, Matt, the sense of, you know, the ordinariness or just also um, God with us is a, has a kind of, it it could be, it could, it could sound very sort of, um, I don't know, metaphorical or like not real, like God is with us. And what we get in, what we get in, um, Isaiah and what we get in the Psalm is like, like a concreteness to God with us or like a, an, an immediacy or like a, this is tangible. This is not just like theoretical or like, oh yeah, God is with us. Uh, that, that, that you're going to be able to see it and touch it and taste it and smell it. And, uh, thus the incarnation. Uh, but But there's something about that, yeah, that concreteness that I'm hearing in these texts that I think we're called to as well, that when we say the promise of God with us, uh, that it's not, it's not this sort of ephemeral, something you can't really grasp onto, but we say it and we hope for the best. It it has that tangibility that, uh, that both I think Isaiah and the Psalm are speaking to. Yeah, I like, appreciate that a lot. When I've, when I've led trips to the Holy Land, I've often will ask people, you know, what's a holy place to you? Mm-hmm. And the response usually, you know, these we're all North American Protestants. The response is always, well, all places are holy to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, I, I know what you're trying to say, but that doesn't really count. You know what I mean? But Because it is too ephemeral, right? Of course mm-hmm. God's with us. God's always with us. But here's the particularity of, uh, no, somebody's going to have a child and, and somebody's going to name that child Emmanuel mm-hmm. as a declaration of their own faith, of their own hope. Mm-hmm. And like you said, it's a baby you can touch. You even said taste, which was kind of weird, but. <laughs> well, I was looking at that. I mean, I was, um, I think I was thinking about the curds and the honey. Oh, I see. You're not advocating tasting babies. No, okay. no. I was just thinking of the curds and the honey. Got it. <laughs> The, um, the, there's a tangibleness of all of the um, activities that we perform during the Christmas season. Um, and, and sometimes it feels like it's a ritual that we've just got to do and get through. Um, but I think uh, originally they were trying to get to, um, let's make this more than just words, but let's embody it. And so we embody it in a drama. We 
Um, we don't just tell our children the, the Christmas narrative. We invite them to perform it so that they know it. And um, if we think about that as we're uh, planning all of the activities uh, around this season, for the preacher to be able to include that it's not just the performance uh, of Christmas Day or Christmas Eve or Christmas um, season, but it's the performance of our lives that demonstrate that we believe God is with us, that becomes our testimony. So not just in the sanctuary during the services, but in our lives because of this story resonating with us and it not being ephemeral, but it actually being a performance of our confidence that God indeed is with us. I'm not sure anybody's going to preach on Psalm 80 the week before Christmas, but it might get woven in there some way, somehow. But I, I'm struck by that language of stir up your might and come to save us. Then the refrain of restore us. And maybe it would be helpful to, for a preacher to reflect a bit on what's the difference between crying, save me versus save us or restore me versus restore us. Mm -hmm. and how implied here is a community that understands the importance of that community's own health or well-being, if anybody's going to be healthy or saved. Yeah. And to talk about what, is, what does that kind of a cry mean when we utter that? Because yes. I'm on a sinking ship, I'm going to be screaming, save me, help me. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's the kind of person I am. But... Yeah. Romans? Let's move to Romans. Sure. This is uh this is an interesting Advent text, isn't it? But, yes. but it's yeah. a lovely yeah, it's a lovely gospel synopsis in some ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I my eye fell on on verse five, this idea of through Christ we've received we've received grace and apostleship. Mm -hmm. And I think if Advent is, like I tried to contend early on, this experience of, of discontinuity or alienation between what it's supposed to be like and how it is, mm -hmm. that grace and apostleship are two gifts from God for navigating that landscape. Mm -hmm. I was how thinking... How do we live in the life not yet? Well, grace... Mm -hmm important, obviously, but then also apostleship to have a, a role to play. I was thinking about two, two aspects of this text for Advent. Uh, the first is the, uh, the way in which Paul, you know, Paul, a servant of Christ, set apart for the gospel of God and how, how and I think on our dominant parlance in Christian circles, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ, but that, that God, uh, God was about gospel way before Jesus came along. And that, that this, is uh, that this, the sending of Jesus, the presence of Jesus is an extension of this, of this gospel that God has been about. And that might be uh, Evangelion, that might be something that the preacher, the direction, a direction a preacher might go that in all of this, this is what, this is what God is about. Um, this is what, uh, this is what, and, and all the themes that we've been lifting up in terms of who Jesus is, that this is an extension of what gospel is, uh, and sort of kind of unpack that a little bit. The other thing though, is, is with a little bit of wordsmithing, a little bit of maybe, yeah, a little bit of wordsmithing, a little bit of reworking a couple of things. This would be a lovely confession of faith mm -hmm. on this day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that uh, we believe in the gospel of God, which God promised beforehand through God's prophets and the Holy Scriptures. And 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 then ending at verse six, including yourself, including ourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. I would that's that's what I would do with this is to replace your your confession of faith with this confession that is uh like you said it's a it's a summary of of what christmas really is and then the call it would be for us to perform it